Amen. Amen. Praise God. I want to turn your attention today to the book of Jonah. I want to say thank you to all of the visitors that have taken time to be with us on this chilly Sunday. Sub-zero temperatures, and we got a house full of people worshiping God. Thankful for that, aren't you? I'm thankful to anyone that's watching online because you were not able to get here due to the weather. We honor you. We want you to feel no judgment today, but we do pray the Holy Ghost would move in your home, that God would bless you. I hope you're feeling there at least a touch of what we're feeling here. Praise God. Praise God. Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. And God saw their works. This is the people of Nineveh. They have repented. They have turned. They turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil. He turned from that evil that he had said he would do unto them. And he did it not. But it displeased Jonah. Verse 1 of chapter 4 says. And not just a little bit. What's the Bible say? Exceedingly. And he was very angry. Some kind of preacher. But before we judge him too harshly, we need to know the full story. Jump to verse 6, if you will. Let's read a little more. And the Lord, God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that he might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. Jonah was exceeding glad of that gourd. But God prepared a worm. When the morning rose the next day, smote the gourd, ate the root of that thing, the stem of it, and it withered away. And it came to pass when the sun did arise, God prepared that east wind. The sun beat upon the head of Jonah, and he fainted. He wished himself to die. He said, it'd be better if I was dead than living. God said to Jonah, doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? He said, do you have a right to be angry over the gourd? What did Jonah say? I do. <laughs> you ever felt justified with God? I do well to be angry. Even to death, I'm so mad I'd rather die. Then said the Lord, thou hast had pity on the gourd for which thou hast not labored, neither made it to grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night? You got more mercy for a plant that popped up and vanished away than you do for people? And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city wherein are more than six core, thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand? And also much cattle. They, they, they don't know. They can't discern. And if you've been in many of my classes, you know I believe in discernment. But I don't think we should have to discern what we can discuss. And discussion from the pulpit happens through the emphasis of the text that tells us and asks us a question. How shall they hear without a preacher? feel such direction of the Lord to minister on this thought today, the root of the issue. The root of the issue is why some of you have had to break through in worship just a few minutes ago. And yet at the same time, on the other side of that pendulum, the root of the issue is why some of you had to stand there so stoic and couldn't do anything. I want you to Hear me on the heels of that song. God can still do whatever is necessary in your life. 
He can do whatever is needed. From time to eternity, He is the one and only. Beside Him, there is no other. If you believe it, I want you to lift your voice in prayer with me right now. God, help us in this house. Help me. I want to preach with wisdom. I want to preach with clarity. I want to preach under the anointing of your spirit. Let your people grow because of our time together in your house. Thank you for those that have been baptized already this weekend. Thanks for those that will repent and be baptized and filled with your spirit here today. Thank you for the members, whether new or mature members, oh God, that are going to take new steps in you. Even this day, we pray it. We ask it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Before you're seated, find somebody maybe you haven't talked to yet and just ask them, do you know the root of the issue? Now, whether you've asked a neighbor that question or whether you've turned and pretended, you may be seated here today. I recently came across a little article talking about how to get to the root of a problem. Any of us that have ever grown up with those parents trying to help at one point or another, you once were young, now you're a little older, you have probably been in the scenario or situation where a parent finally frustrated and hearing all the yapping they could stand, said, hey, what's the problem? Well, what's the real, what's the root of the problem? And in this article, in order to get to the root of the problem, they determined it this way. They call it the rule of the five whys. The rule of the five whys, the five questions. And so here, I want to ask you if you'd follow me. I think they have it here for us, this little journal uh, entry as it were. Problem is this, you got caught speeding. If you've ever been there, raise your hand. <laughs> we have a quick church. Fast, expedited. Okay, first why. Here's why. You were late for work. That's why I got caught speeding. Got, got caught speeding, why? Because you were late for work. Well, but why were you late for work? It's the second why. Because you got up late. But why, the third why, did you get up late? I was tired. I hit the snooze button. Let the snooze button people say amen, amen. in five minutes. <laughs> Set you up. That's good. Hit that snooze button. But then there's, he said, keep going. What's the fourth why? Why'd you hit it? Well, because I went to sleep. Too late. Any college students able to go, hmm. I went to sleep too late and had to get up too early, so I hit the snooze. So I, but I hit the snooze because I went to sleep too late. And they said, but ask a fifth why. What's the fifth why? And the why says, because I was watching YouTube. The whole rule of five whys was if you keep asking why, you'll get back to the problem, not what is displaying as the problem. The problem isn't that you were speeding. The problem is that you weren't disciplined to go to bed on time. But how many know it's easier to point at the right now than it is to dig into the thing that asks me to really evaluate how I'm living? I want us to take a look here at Jonah. We've preached about Jonah. We've talked about Jonah. Most of you have sang songs about Jonah. We have veggie-tailed about Jonah. We have 
Jonah, I didn't until we're Jonahed out. We've had Jonah in the well and out of the well, in seaweed, on the sand. We've had Jonah on the boat. We've had Jonah in the water. We've had Jonah every way. But today I'd like to ask a question. Should we judge Jonah without knowing why he didn't want to preach to Nineveh? Well, yeah, absolutely we should. Pastor, he's a preacher. Preachers should preach wherever they sent. I, I agree, especially when it's God's call. But I do think it's worth evaluating when you would rather run from God than do his will. And when God's call upon your life is to be traded in and even you're ready to find yourself on a ship headed the wrong way, is there not more to the story? And so without getting into great detail, I would like to ask some whys backward. And when I ask those whys backward, I start looking at the affliction of the Assyrian people. The blood that had been shed by the Assyrian leaders, those who have taken from generation to generation, they're heading there and they're staying in Nineveh. They have shed blood upon the people that represent what Jonah knows and holds dear. And so to put it in modern context for those of us that gather in this house, take an old family trial, something like the Hatfields and the McCoys. And I would tell you, regardless of what you've seen or read or watched, it would pale in comparison to the gruesome nature of the Assyrian attacks and the blood that had been shed. The cruelty of their punishment is noted in history as that which is beyond that of any other army. The cruelty of the Assyrian army and their absolute lack of any uh, respect for humanity. And Jonah is in a place where generation after generation has suffered the persecution. And so while he might have been mad and could have been mad at a few instead of being mad at one or one king or one group of people or one army over time it turns into an entire people group I would tell you that's where prejudice comes from that although he himself had never tasted the blood of a sword inflicted into his own body, he had heard the stories and he had felt the suffer and the persecution and it had worked its way into his own understanding. And because of the effect of turmoil and torture that had so affected those that he knew and held dear and his people group, the effect that had been done through a series, it, it had become this uh, Thing that legends would be known of, the way they treated people. And over time, there was this digging in into the spirit of, of Jonah. You've got to be careful, and I've got to be careful, that generations before don't allow things to be rooted in. I told somebody recently, I will fight sin to the very death, but I will not fight the, I will not fight the earthly wars of old men that were based on personalities and preferences. When it comes to the kingdom of God, we can't afford to choose sides. Here's whose side we're on, the Lord's. On the Lord's side. Say, wait a minute, Pastor Carson, wasn't Assyria wrong for what they did? Absolutely yes, a thousand times yes. The way that those people were, were destroyed, the way that those people were wounded and killed for generation after generation, it was wrong. And if you're looking for a way to justify it, I'm telling you anybody in this room with common sense could pull Jonah aside and say, you have every right to be hurt. You have every right to be mad. You have every right to allow this. But what you can't allow is the root of bitterness. The root of, listen to me now, the root of bitterness from yesterday's loss to become that which assassinates today's calling. What is the root of bitterness? Hebrews 12 and 15 speaks about that root of bitterness. And most of us in this room today, we don't like to talk about bitterness. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. I know that you were hurt 15 years ago, 20 years ago. I know they lied on you. They mistreated you. Some of you have suffered genuine, genuine hurt. But if you are not 
not careful, that root of bitterness will keep you from your past, from his, from his grace today. He has a work for you to do that if you're not careful, he will call you and you like Jonah. Jonah, I want you to preach and go on record as what will be to date the greatest revival ever witnessed. I want to use you to walk in a city where they are pagan in their belief and they are worshiping something that is so contrary to, to worshiping the God of the Old Testament. But Jonah, I want to send you in there as my prophet and as my preacher. And when you preach, I want to do a work through you. And Jonah said, no. And the root of his no was because he knew he was such a good preacher. It's not what he thought. He knew God was such a good God that if he preaches, they're going to turn. I would ask Jonah for an examination. I'd ask for an examination. Let there be an MRI of your heart spiritually to have to dig in and evaluate what level of anger and frustration and Bitterness must be in there that really when you are laid bare before God, you'd rather them be lost than saved. And it is a tough, it is a tough thing for evaluation when we as the people of God must allow him to dig deep into our spirit and ask us a question like this. What assignments would you not let him put you on? Because their family hurt you 20 years ago. Or you've never got over the fact that he lied about your dad. Awkward pause for effect. The fact that she walked out on you 10 years ago and so you've built this self-constructed cocoon of the way that you self-preserve. And so now everything's right as you see it's right. And the only time it's wrong is when God challenges that. But I want to remind us here today on this blustery cold day here in January of 24 that if God can ask Jonah to change, he better be able to ask us to change. If he can ask Jonah to do evaluation after death imposed by the Assyrians, he better be able to ask us to do self-evaluation and be willing to carry his word to every people group, to every family member, to every neighbor, to every co-worker. What about the coworker that lied about you on Facebook? What about the person you work with that you know lied about you to your boss? Can I be transparent? I had to go to the I, I had to go publicly to honor and pray for someone in the last week that I know lied on me. I know they lied on me. Judgment's not mine. Judgment's not yours. Judgment is the Lord's. Had somebody tell me not long ago, you know, Pastor Carson, people are constantly looking for flaws for you. Let them look. People are looking for flaws in everybody. People that look for flaws in others are looking for flaws in others so they can justify their own rotten spirit. It's just the truth. I'm telling us here today, we cannot live our lives today based on the hurts of yesterday. We've got to allow God to move us forward, and we've got to love people in spite of judgment. We've got to love them in spite of what they've done right and in spite of what they've done. Jonah, go to Nineveh. He said, no, I ain't going. Not doing it. Not preaching. Brother Turner, Jared Turner, can you imagine asking a young man, I want you to go preach. I want you to go preach. And them looking at you and saying, no. Would you ever ask them again? <laughs> God would. <laughs> I set you. I set you. See what I did? I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to either. God said, God said, Jonah, go. He said, no, I ain't going. And you watch. Please watch this. When Jonah turns what should have been a yes into a no, his life starts going like this. It's a downward spiral. Down to the ship, 
sailing down to Tarshish, ends up down in the water, down in the well, down in the box. Your no will take you down. Your no to the will of God. Standing on principle. Well, you're about to stand on the water. Because you're no to the will of God. Boy, I feel that. I'm going to just stay there for a second. You're no to the will of God. I don't want to talk to them. They hurt me. I know they hurt you. But aren't you glad he loved you after you hurt him? Am I the only one here that's ever hurt God? I bet I'm not the only one that has hurt God over and over and over again. And yet every time I call him up, he answers the phone, talks to me again, loves me again, wraps his arms around me. I know they hurt you, but there is healing in moving on. Elbow your neighbor, tell him we got to move on. We got to move on. We got to move on. He does. He ends up in this place where he is, he is pulled. He is pulled deep into his own self-pity. Self-pity is crippling. He's bitter. He's bitter over the past. He's bitter over what they might do. Aren't you thankful that the root of his reach is greater than the root of our bitterness? I'm going to say it again. The root of his reach is greater than the root of our bitterness. Thank you, God, that we have this book because you kept reaching for Jonah. It should have been over for Jonah when he got on that boat. If most of us were God, when he got on the boat selling for Tarshish, we'd have, I tried. I talk, I reach, I call, I text, they didn't even text back. Uh, you laugh because you did it. You've done it. You're like, eh, uh, eh, get out of my business. I tried to call them. Can you believe that? And then we'll talk about, can you believe they didn't even call me back? Get you on the boat, God should have been done. Get you into the place where the storm is raging. The people are throwing other stuff overboard and they cast lots. Who's the lot, lot fall on? Who's the lot fall on? Who's it? Who? It's Jonah. It's his problem. What have you done? They ask him. Ah, throw me in the water. <laughs> this guy is in a, he is psychologically unstable. He really is. Read the story. He's asked to die multiple times. which is maybe a little note for some people in the room that thank God can't use you because you've been a little unstable. Just because you hit a low moment thinking you don't have the potential to turn right around and turn a great. He's up and he's down. He's, he's in and out. He's, he's, throw me in the water. Just, just do it. And they look at each other. We can't throw it in the water. And then the storm gets a little worse and one guy's like, well, maybe we can throw him in. Imagine the mental hurdle they got to go through till eventually they're like, all right, let's throw him in the water. <laughs> Did they even celebrate? That's the one thing I want to know. When he hits the water and sinks and the storm goes, are they like, ah? <laughs> but when you get out of the will in your life, you have the potential to put a storm in the lives of others. When you get out of the will of God and the calling of God, <laughs> they talk to somebody in this room that's running from the will of God and yet it seems like now every person you're around, relationship after relationship has become stormy. You're running from the will of God and it's affecting everything you do. It's that water. And if it's not enough, he, he gets swallowed by a fish. Oh, the grace of God is weird. How do you do that post-whale interview? Back up. 
felt like the belly of a whale. How was it in there? It's dark. It stunk. But I'm alive. Some of you are in a place where it's dark and it stinks. But you're still breathing. And he's kept you along. And he's kept you alive. And he's really probably got you in a position that you are at a depth. The truth is, had Jonah not been in that well, he could not have handled the pressure that the depth would but he's put you in something that while it might be dark and it, the situation might stink, it is keeping you so that you still might pray a prayer. He said, I prayed as it were a prayer from the belly of hell. And I got news for somebody in this room, regardless of how bad you feel about where you're at. It doesn't matter if it's the darkest place you've ever been in. If the situation you're in stinks like no situation you've ever been in. In fact, your own description, you might feel like you're in the belly of hell. I got good news for you. God hears prayers even from the belly of hell. Even There is no height too great. There is no depth too low. When you call on the name of the Lord, when you come to yourself and say, God, I'm calling on you from this. I'm talking to somebody in this room right now. In spite of your certain, your, your, your current context, if you would just call. Yeah, but people know my situation. People know what I'm dealing with. Who cares if they know? God knows your situation. And if he can hear Jonah from the belly of the great fish, you better believe me that he can hear you. He can hear you. And he will turn his ear unto you. Let me ask a question in this house, in this Calvary this morning. Does anybody believe that his ear is not deaf that he cannot hear? And even if you're in the very depths of the sea, his arm is not short that he cannot reach. But he can, if he can calm the, come on, if he can calm the storm and he can open up the whale to swallow you, to preserve you, he can tell the whale it's time, it's time to deliver him up to his purpose. Whether they like it or not, it is time. Yeah. And Jonah gets belched up by a fish. Nothing about it is glamorous except for this. He gets another chance to do the will of God. Where are my second chance people? <laughs> Where are my third chance people? Where are my fourth? If I'd ask the wise back far enough, it isn't that God wasn't good. It isn't that God let me down. If I ask the wise back far enough, it's just that I made some dumb decision, had some poor life discipline that got me in a mess. But in spite of all the wise, I get to cut through all the whys and come to the how. And the how is based on this. His grace. His grace was sufficient through it all. His grace was good for me when I said no the first time. His grace was good for me when I got on the boat. His grace was there for me when I hit the water. His grace was there for me when I got in the well. His grace was there for me in the deep. His grace was there for me when I thought it was over. His grace, his grace was there all along. And because of his grace, I get another chance. Woo! The root of the issue. The root of the issue is that his grace is greater than your. It's greater than your question. It's greater than your sin. It's greater than your dilemma. The Lord sent me on assignment to tell some people in this room. Family hurt has crippled you. It's not what somebody else did to your family. It's what your family did to each other. And it's crippled you. 
That's where people sit down. I know. Go ahead. This is normal. Think of how I feel. If I had a chair, I'd sit down. That's... To others in this room, you hear me right now. You love God, you're still a person of faith, but you really represent a lot more right now that man in the Bible that said, I believe, but help my unbelief. It's not been family hurt, but it's been sickness. And sickness has taken a piece of your faith. And it has twisted it. The root of the issue is not that you don't believe the word of God. It's that you prayed a thousand times. And what the enemy has tried to do is take the root of your faith and replace it with a root of bitterness. But I've come to preach in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we're ripping out every root of bit. We're ripping out every root of bitterness. We're ripping out every root of turmoil. We're going to leave void in the ground of our hearts where the root of bitterness has tried to make our talking ugly and our speech divisive and our words contentious. I'm talking, I'm going to preach it how I feel. It's made some of you, it's taken your prayers from aggressive to passive, and it's time to get your aggressive prayer tongue back. It's time for, I'm going to say that again, it's time for you to get your aggressive prayer tongue back. For some of you, you used to walk the aisles of this church praying in the spirit, but you got wounded and it's taken that root of faith and that root of love and it's begun to replace it in this, this root of faith that was there. It's now this root of complacency. There was a root of faith and now it's a root of apathy because ever since they died, nothing even matters. Jonah, what's your problem? I'll tell you my problem. You want to get to the root of my problem? Things didn't go right. That's the root of it. And you can take that answer and you can apply it to every life dilemma across the board. You can apply it to every situation from physical to mental to spiritual. Things didn't go the way they should have went. And I can't stand it. And God is looking at Jonah saying, I didn't ask you whether you like what happened. I'm asking you, will you preach? He's looking at people in January in Calvary Tabernacle on this cold day in Indianapolis. And he's asking you, in spite of what went wrong, can you be a voice of what's right? In spite. In spite. Oh, Boy, I felt that just hit me like a wave. It was loss. I need you to lift your hands with me right now. It was loss. You haven't been right since they died. You haven't been able to feel complete in Him since. Ah. Oh, come on, it's a lie of the enemy to become bitter. I 
I'm opening these altars right now for somebody that wants to run to the altar and say, it's okay, God, I need your help. I want your help. I want your help. I need your help. I want to move forward. I want your help. I need your help. God, I want to be the first one here telling you, God, I want your help. Don't let that sickness make us bitter. Don't let that loss make us. Don't let what they did to the. Old hurts, old prejudice. Old frustration. Old injury, old wounds. I'm asking every person in the building, make an altar. Whether you come down front or you make an altar in your pew, everybody needs to make an altar right now. God, put a yes in my spirit for your will. If you don't know what to pray, let that be your prayer. Let me have a yes in my spirit for your will.
In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the remission of sin. We are so thankful for the grace of God, for the mercy of God, for the mercy of God. Did Jonah preach? Yes, he preached. But he preached with hurt in his heart. God used him. God used him. But it's not until the very end of that story with that small plant, that gourd, it's not till the very end where the Lord has to ask him a question. How, how can you feel more grace for a plant than you feel for people? It's a statement that each and every one of us have to wrestle with. I want to conclude sending you away in prayer today with the words from Lisa Tierker's book, Forgiving What You Cannot Forget. She wrote these words which grabbed at my heart. She herself having dealt with great betrayal, great pain, and making it very clear that only God and God alone is the reason that she has been able to come back from that hurt. She wrote these words, Bitterness does not have a core of hate. Bitterness has a core of hurt. And the Lord sent me on assignment to remind us here today that the root of the issue is not our hurt. The root of the issue is His love. And His love can heal our hurt. It can heal our family. Thank you, Brother Barkis, for being used. If we will lift up and tell Him we need His help. Don't let Nineveh stay lost because I'm hurt. <laughs> Please don't let me keep past anger. Please don't let me hold on to past anger. I'm asking somebody to pray that prayer or at least get it in your spirit. Please don't let me hold on to that past anger with a cousin that hurt you, a family member that wounded you. You might have every right, Jonah, but God is calling. You might feel justified, but God is still calling. And if God can, as we read in the text, turn from the evil he had decided against them, and if God can turn grace toward them, oh, Help us to turn grace. We extend grace one to another, but we do it by examining the root in our own life. What is that root? That root that Isaiah would prophesy that it would be the root of Jesse. The branches would spring forth. We wouldn't really totally understand it until the book of Revelation when it talks about the root of David. It takes it from being the offshoot and the offspring of David to then being the root of David. What, what does it all mean? How does it work? We know that it was pointing to the Christ. Salvation. Deliverance. No matter what you've done today, you've not gone so far that he is not calling. 
No matter what you've embarked on or embraced, you have not gone so deep or gotten so far. If he saw Jonah there, he sees you. He hears, he sees, he calls. Let our answer be yes to the call and to the will of God. Stand with me all over this house. What is the root? What is the root? What is the root of the issue? The root of it all is love. It's the love of God, the grace of God. So God, as we walk out of this house today, we say yes to your love and not our hurt. We say yes to your mending and not our brokenness. We say yes to your strength and not to the, not to the weakness. We say yes to your encouragement and at the same time we say no to that root of discouragement. We say yes to your call upon our family to be godly and in in turn, we are saying no to that call of the enemy for us to be less and to allow that root of mediocrity to take. We say yes to you.